of the Lord, and I bring greetings back from the Country View Baptist Church in Ulysses, Kansas, and uh, the, the pastor there, Brother James Berry, and a lot of you know him anyway, had the opportunity to present Brother Benito's work this past Wednesday evening, and uh, just uh, thanking the Lord for the opportunity to do that, and fellowship with the church and some people that I haven't seen in a long time, and it's even better to be home. There's not six trees in the whole state of Kansas, I don't think. A lot of wind, and it's good to be back home. Uh, just a few things to, to mention. Um, WC asked us to put uh, to put Janice Keith on the prayer list. That's Geraldine's wife, and you've uh, put her on the prayer list. She's having some neck surgery. When's that coming up? Tomorrow. So you be in prayer for Miss Janice. And then also, uh, Jake Southern asked me to announce and uh, it's a prayer request as well. Tomorrow, is it tomorrow? Is that right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, they are finalizing Bodie's adoption in, in Cleveland at the Johnson City Courthouse at 1.30 in the afternoon. So uh, you be in prayer about that. Of course, everybody's welcome. If you want to drive to Cleveland, you can do that. But, but be in prayer nonetheless for all of that proceeding. Any other prayer requests that we need to add to the list this morning? Uh -oh. Yes, Mally's appointment is in the morning. Got moved up, and they'll be taking, this is the stage where they're taking a little while. So they've got a full of wisdom, too, to do that. Who needs it? But that, they're going to take that out, and she's, they're going to take a little biopsy out of it and find out what it, exactly it is that we're dealing with. That's tomorrow, 7 o'clock, 7.45. Yeah, they said that her jawbone is fairly deteriorated and thin at this point. And so there, there's a risk there that just from pulling the tooth that their, her jawbone could be in danger. So be in prayer for that. Good old boy, our neighbor. on the prayer list, Mr. He's had a knee replaced years ago. There's an infection in it now. They're going to have to take the knee out for six weeks and try to get rid of the infection before they put the knee in. Uh, he's no he no kind of chicken like me. So. What's his name again? Fred Alvord. Fred Alvord. A D O R D. Pray for this person. He's got a good friend in that moment there, Jimmy Horn. He passed away the other day. Uh, remember his family and also his wife Pam. She's been waiting for uh, the loss to reverse. Whenever they can get to that, they own the pizza pro there in Dion. Also, Jim Bob Walker passed away. Remember all these things? Prayer? Oh. Yeah. Oh. The last report I heard on Charles Faulkner was that he's still at MD Anderson and waiting on a on a bone marrow donor. Isn't that what they're trying to find? They got him on the list trying to find a bone marrow donor for a transplant. So be praying for Charles. Anybody else? Anybody got a praise or worship or testimony this morning?
Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here, <coughs> listen to this phrase, present before God to hear all these things that are commanded thee of God. You can be seated this morning. <coughs> Chapter 8, the, the Ethiopian eunuch is saved as Philip attaches himself to the chariot. Chapter number 9, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, was saved on the Damascus Road. In chapter number 10 of Acts, in chapter number 11, we find the story, the account, the record of a man named Cornelius and his family and his friends they hear the gospel, they receive the gospel, and they are saved. I like this chapter, uh, chapters 10 and chapter 11, that is. What we have set before us is an account of, an example of, first of all, personal evangelism. God called Peter and said, I want you to go to the house with these people. I want you to go and witness unto them. Personal evangelism. Peter could have done what a lot of Christians do today, uh, what we do sometimes, and that is when God gives us the opportunity to witness the gospel, to share the gospel. Sometimes, unfortunately, in our flesh, we decline and we say, well, we'll just let somebody else get to them. If I don't say anything about it to them, maybe somebody else will come along and tell them about Jesus. And I must admit that I've missed opportunities in my life and I've had to go back and pray, Lord, I missed that opportunity. Please send somebody else uh, to, uh, to, to do what I missed and messed up the first time. But the, but the opportunities that are yet before us today, I want you to understand, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, and God impresses upon you to be a witness for somebody in your life or in your family, He expects you to do it. Right. And it may well be, it may well be that you are the only person in this whole world that can reach that person. Personal evangelism. This text also puts before us the example of personal salvation. And I know that all of his house and whoever was there, it says that they all received the gospel. And I'm thankful for that. And I thank God for what some people call household salvation. And that is that, uh, that in some families it's a, it's a blessing. It's, a, it's wonderful to have assurance that everyone in the house is saved. Isn't that a blessing? But the reality of it is, that's not always the way it is. And whenever you get into chapter 10 and verse number 43, it, it explains to us that it's a whosoever salvation. It's a, it's a personal salvation, friend. Just because your mama and your grandma are saved don't mean that you're automatically going to heaven. Y'all have me this morning. It's a personal salvation. His family and friends hear the gospel. Chapter 10 records how God arranges for them to hear the gospel message and the truth about the saving power of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful how God arranged? He arranged in the life of the Apostle Peter and He arranged in the life of Cornelius and, and, uh, and all of these people. And, and God does that. And God has arranged it where we could be here and hear the gospel. And you could be here today and hear the gospel. And thank God for the miraculous way that He moves things around and arranges things. Hey, just the fact that we were born in the United States, in this country, is a privilege and a blessing that God has given upon us that we might be raised in an environment where we could hear the gospel. And God arranges for them at the end of chapter 10 and tells us that they that heard the gospel, that the Holy Ghost fell upon them, that they spake in tongues and that they were baptized uh, in, in the, in the, into the church, we might say, they were baptized. And having that information at the end of chapter number 10, we can draw with, with confidence the conclusion that before they were in filled with the Holy Ghost, before they were baptized, that these people had put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
They had accepted Christ and been born again. But I must admit that I like the fact that it doesn't leave any loose ends. It doesn't leave any questions to be asked because you get to chapter 11 and verse 14 and Peter is recounting this. He's rehearsing this with the, uh, with the church people back up at Jerusalem and he simply uses this word when he talks about Cornelius and the Gentile family. He said they were saved. I like that word, don't you? See, it's wonderful to be baptized. It's wonderful to know the, the power of the Holy Ghost and to, and to have the Holy Spirit to, uh, to speak to our hearts and to direct our, 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 our life. And that's all a wonderful thing. But friend, it's predicated upon whether or not we're saved, been born again, and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This man, Cornelius, represents a big deal in the New Testament. You understand, this represents that the Gentile can be saved just like the Jew. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That ought to mean something to you, friend, because I don't know if you know it or not, but you're a Gentile. <laughs> I mean, if Cornelius said that, if Peter had said, no, Jesus said he could save you because you're a Gentile, we'd all be in trouble. I mean, we'd be as good as in hell right now if Jesus didn't die for the Gentile. Aren't you glad what Paul said? There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. This man, Cornelius, represents a big deal. Let's take a closer look at some of this this morning. We'll be here for a few weeks in these chapters. First of all, about Cornelius. And when I use him, I'm using him as a representative for this whole house, this whole group of people. But number one, if you're taking notes, his heart, I notice about him, his heart was longing for God. In verse number, in chapter 10 and verse 2, it tells us that he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. It was the nature of these people, at least at this point in time in their life, it was Cornelius' nature that he was seeking after God. I mean, so much as they knew about God. What they knew about Him, they were seeking. To, can I tell you this morning, friends, there's a lot of people in, in so-called churches and religious groups and gatherings around America today that as far as they know about God, what they think they know about God, they're trying to seek the Lord. They're trying to do what's right. They didn't know, they didn't have to, talking about Cornelius here, they didn't have to seek after, he was a Roman, he was a Gentile, uh, he wasn't expected to seek after the God of Israel. He wasn't expected to, to be interested in what they were talking about down at the local synagogue. I mean, he, he could have fell in with the pagans and followed after all the little g-gods of the Greeks and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Gentiles of that day. They didn't have to. But he had something in his heart, a desire in his heart that he wanted to be right. He was drawn to this religion the Israel religion, the, Judea, the, the Jewish religion, we might say. Now, that being said, not everybody's like that. You may have come today uh, to this place, and if you're lost, that is in the mindset that, uh, that, that you're not looking for God. You're just here because Mama made you come, or you're just here because uh, you felt like it was uh, it was something that would help you with a, with a relationship in your life. Whatever the reason is, but maybe your mindset is today that you're not looking for God. You don't care about God. You're not seeking for God. Uh, you don't care about any of that. And if that is your mindset today, my prayer is, is that God would touch your heart and that you would see yourself a sinner and that you would be saved today. That's my prayer for you. I mean, listen, you wouldn't be alone in that crowd because Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Not everybody comes looking for God. But I wonder if there would be any here uh, 
that's not saved, but you have a mind to be right, you're hoping that you are right with God, and uh, my prayer is this morning, if you're not saved, that you find what you're looking for. I tell you, there's a lot of places today where they're, they're quote-unquote preaching, quote-unquote preaching the Word of God, but they're spilling false doctrine from the pulpit, and if you went there looking for Jesus, you're not going to find Him. But I hope that today, if that's what you're looking for, that you find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever your mindset is this morning, maybe you're like Cornelius. Maybe you are devoted. They were devoted. He was a devout man. He was devoted to Bible study. He was devoted to the house of the Lord. He was devoted to prayer. Can I tell you this this morning? There's a lot of people, religious people in the world that are lost, but they're a whole lot more devoted than some of the Christians are. Devoted to the Word of God. Can I, can I get a witness this morning that devotion to Bible study and the house of the Lord and to prayer doesn't make you saved? They were devoted people. They were benevolent people. They gave of their alms to the people. They, they gave of their substance. <coughs> can I also remind you this morning, there's a lot of lost people in our world today that are a whole lot more generous with their stuff than some of us believers are. Yeah. I, I remember as a little kid, sitting and watching a man of means in church. I'm not talking about some poor guy. I'm talking about a person of means roll up a dollar bill and a little bitty roll and put it in the offering plate. You say, well, you should have been paying attention to what he was doing. I was a nosy little kid. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but even way back then, I was smart enough to figure 10%. Something didn't add up. <laughs> I remember preaching at a church one time. And, uh, and filling in for, uh, filling in for a, a, a church at one time, and they had a little board just like we have back here that showed their tithes and offerings of $200 a week. Well, I don't know who gave what, but I know the people, and I knew some of the business people that went to church there, and the $200 didn't add up when you figure it 10%. I mean, there's a whole lot of people in this world that are more generous than God's people seem to be sometimes. They had, they had Cornelius and his family, they had implemented religion in their life. And they had implemented good biblical principles for all intents and purposes from a human perspective. We can observe this family and we can say these were good people. But the time came... When they got under conviction and the Lord showed them that there was something missing in their life. Is anybody here that can remember when you came under the conviction of God and realized that you were missing something in your life? God does the work of conviction. Maybe it is that you were already involved in church just like I was before I got saved. Maybe you were already trying to do what was right and uh, trying to please your parents and trying to uh, be a good person and the Holy Ghost showed you that there was something still missing in your life. And aren't you glad that He shows us exactly what that is in the Gospel? It needed to be saved. It needed to be born again. Had a heart that was longing for God. Something else I see about Cornelius in this passage that's, uh, that's noteworthy, I believe, and that is the reality that his prayers were limited. The last part of verse number 2, it tells us that he prayed to God always. He was continually praying. The man Cornelius had needs such as is common to all men everywhere. He had a family that needed praying for, and he had a government that he lived under and tried to serve and live under. He had finances just like you and I do. He had health issues just like people do. He had a longing for peace and joy in his heart just like all people do. And he uh, wanted to have assurance of his standing with God just like I hope you do. And, uh, and so 
so he prayed about things just like everybody else does. But there's a biblical principle that we can't overlook here. And that is the biblical fact that God doesn't hear the prayers of lost people the same way He does the prayers of saved people. I mean, does it not say in John chapter 9 and verse 31 that God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners? Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 4, 14 through 16 tells us that it is the saved people, the redeemed of God, the one who have Christ as our high priest, that it is the saved people who have been given access to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. So, the question in my mind is this, why does it say God was hearing His prayers? There was a memorial before God for His prayers. I think the key to understanding that is the answer that God gives to Cornelius' prayers. As Cornelius is no doubt praying for his family and for his government and for his finances and for his health and for peace and joy and assurance and all of these things that men pray for, while he's praying for these things, we notice that God only gives one simple solution, one simple answer to all of his prayers. And that is the gospel. The gospel. God understood from heaven that if Cornelius could get saved, that was the answer to all of his problems in this life. But that was the beginning of answered prayers. It would change everything in his life and in the lives of those who would believe if they would be saved. Can I tell you this morning that being saved will change everything in your life? Either physically or spiritually. Right. In this sense, God has heard the prayer of sinful man and has given the answer to all men. For Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And that solution is the gospel. You say, preacher, I've sinned. I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell today. My life is a mess. Is there any way for me to escape the wrath of God and the power of sin in my life? Listen, friend, I came to tell you, God has heard your cry and answered your prayer in the gospel. Right. He's given you a way to be saved. Jesus came and died and was buried and rose again to give us victory, to give us victory over sin and a way to escape the wrath of the Almighty God. We're not the children of wrath. We're not appointed to wrath, those of us that are saved. But we're on our way to heaven because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cornelius, his prayer life, he didn't know it, but it was just fixing to kick off. But before he could get any further, before he could make any headway with the problems in his life, he needed to be saved. Amen. Number three, I find here this man Cornelius, his actions were logical. What he did made sense. It, it made sense. Think about this. First of all, when God spoke to him... He chose to listen. Uh, listen, God is dealing with the hearts of men today. The question is, will you listen? I know that God doesn't indwell people that are not that are not saved, but the Bible explains to us that God works on the hearts of those that are not yet saved. Uh, that, that, that He would bring them to a place of conviction. Will you listen if God's speaking to you today? I can tell you the most logical thing we can do is listen whenever God speaks. Not only that, but when He was searching for the truth, for His own soul's sake and for the sake of those in His family and for the sake of those in His community, when He was searching for truth, notice this, I hope nobody gets offended, but He asked for a Baptist preacher. Didn't He? 
send him down there to Joppa and find Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges in the house of one Simon the Tanner and asks him to come. Well, what's the big deal about the Baptist? Well, he was simply he was simply wanting to hear the one who had the ties all the way back to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And friend, if, if people want the truth today, if you want the truth today, you need to find it from somebody who's directly tied to Jesus Himself all the way back then. And I just ask you this morning, if, if, if the name Baptist offends you, just let me ask you, ask you this away. If the Baptists don't have the truth today, then who does? Right. Where is it at? I mean, he didn't want no Johnny come lately. He didn't want some new religion. He didn't want, he didn't want some new movement to be a part of. Find me somebody that knows what Jesus said and ask him to come. Not only that, but when the truth was spoken, he knew it was the truth that was being spoken. He just accepted it as the truth. Can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that would make comments or whatever that would say, Preacher, it just seems like every time you preach, you're, you're preaching straight at me. <laughs> And, uh, and that's the Lord, by the way, because I don't know the needs of everybody in here. But I don't take any offense to that. But I always follow that up with this simple question. Well, if I'm preaching right at you, do you believe that what you're hearing is the truth? I mean, let's just, let's just get right down to the meat of it. Do you believe what I'm telling you about Jesus Christ is the truth. The truth was spoken. He just accepted it as the truth. Something else logical. He used his influence to gather in his family and friends. We read there when Peter came down to the house. In chapter 10 and verse, uh, verse 24 it looks like. That he found a whole group of people gathered in Cornelius' home used his influence to gather his family and friends in to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Don't you think it would be logical if we loved our kids and our grandkids that we would get them where they could hear the gospel? I, I, I just don't see the logic in raising children outside of the church and on the outskirts and on the outer fringe of the church and then when they're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, we wonder why they still haven't come to saving knowledge of Christ. I mean, it's just logical that if the truth is being spoken down at the house of God, that we would get our, our family and our friends gathered in there. Something else logical, when the gospel was preached, and the way of salvation was explained, as Peter did it down in chapter 10 and verse 43. He said that him gave all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. When he gave that way of salvation, Cornelius accepted Christ as his Savior. By the way, side note, isn't it interesting there, verse 43, the St. Peter that was preaching in Acts 2.38 is the same preacher that's preaching here. He doesn't say anything about baptism for remission of sin. said, well, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. That was the way of salvation. Put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ. Put your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior. And he did it. Isn't that logical? Not only that, but something else. He was baptized as a believer and joined the local church. Makes sense to me. It's what Jesus said to do. And then not only that, but something else logical in verse 48 of chapter 10, we find that he was endeavoring endeavoring to fellowship with the saints of God. Said they prayed him, that is Peter, to tarry certain days. We want to fellowship 
with the redeemed of God. He wasn't interested in going out to the synagogue anymore. He wasn't interested in hanging out with the Judaizers and the Pharisees anymore and learning anything about that. He had accepted Christ as his Savior. He had been baptized and added to the church. He had the Holy Ghost indwelling in him. And he wanted to be with God's people. Sounds logical to me. Say, so, well, preacher, if I get saved, everybody's going to think I'm weird and I'm crazy and that I've lost my mind. I'll be honest with you this morning. Some people may. Some people may think you've lost your mind if you get saved or if you're already saved and you decide to join the church by baptism or whatever. Some people may think you're crazy. But I'll tell you something. There's a room full of people today. We won't think you're crazy. We think it's logical. We think it makes sense that when you hear the gospel that you would accept Christ as your Savior. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you this way this morning. Why would anybody turn down such an offer as God's grace? Don't make any sense. If I was here today and I was lost, I'd get saved. It's logical. Verse 33, and I'll close. Right before Peter begins to preach his message, we're going to look at that in a future day. But right before Peter begins to preach his message in the home of Cornelius, this man Cornelius makes a declaration. He simply says this, We are present before God to hear what God has commanded you to say. In my mind, in other words, this is the same as him saying, this is the time. This is the day. Right now is the time that we have the opportunity to get this right and to get what we've been missing. Now, we're here. We're present before God to hear what you have to say. Can I tell you this morning, I make that same declaration to you. We're present before God. We're here to hear the truth and to Respond to the truth. The Bible says it in another way like this. That today is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. If you're here today and you're lost. Today is the day to be saved. We're not promised another day or another breath. Or another hour or another week or a year. I'm looking for Jesus to come anytime now. How about you? Amen. You're lost. Today is the day of salvation. Would you trust Christ today and be saved? Friend, if you're already saved, you need to be a member of the church, you need to do something for God, commit your life, surrender your life, make a commitment to Him, whatever His will is for your life, today's the day. Like what one old preacher said as he was given the invitation, God wants you today. Today. What would you do as we stand and sing a verse of invitation? Give number 57.
prayer and bless the meal. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house today, Lord. We thank you for the, the fact that you got the gospel to us, you gave us an opportunity uh, and, and time to receive the gospel and be saved. Lord, if there's anyone here that, that's not yet been saved, I pray that today would be the day that they would trust Christ as Savior. Lord, I just pray for the meal, pray for the, the, the service this afternoon that all done here today might bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.